Me, I grew up a military brat, so I've lived uh, about everywhere in the United States. I finally landed in East Lansing, Michigan, to go to Michigan State University Engineering School. And uh, so I pretty much call the Lansing area my home because I've been here longer than any other place in my life. And um, uh, got my degree from uh, Michigan State University. So did Lisa. She graduated with honors in engineering school and I barely graduated. So that's, uh, that's kind of uh, the reality of the situation. Lisa and I, Got married in about 95. We were working at General Motors at the time. We were both engineers, specifically uh, when we were at Oldsmobile and Lansing. We got relocated down to Detroit. I had uh, bought my first Harley in 93. I was playing around with it, and um, in the course of playing around with it, uh, designed a six speed in my basement of my house. Very, uh, very crude, but what it did was I built uh, three prototypes and, and put one in the bike. It actually worked. <laughs> and from that point, with the seed of an idea and also being frustrated at uh, General Motors, uh, we quit our jobs at General Motors and uh, got our money together and decided to give this thing a roll. First sale was in August of 1998. First uh, mention of us in a magazine was in August 1998. And um, we thought we were going to be the only ones in the world. It also happened uh, that RevTech announced their six speed, and um, which really, really uh, surprised us. But uh, we kept our heads down and because we were all American made and uh, they were clearly made in Korea. They made no bones about it. Uh, we were the quality American made small company. RevTech was the overseas Korean uh, offering from a big company. Lisa is the president of the company. Um, I'm uh, the vice president. And the R&D guy, I'm also a uh, carnival clown, I get to go to shows and act silly and throw my hands up in the air and fart and spit and all that shit. So the, the two of us, our, our capabilities complement each other very well. I'll tell you in private, I'm not a wild man, you know, it's kind of my stage face, you know. And in private, I'm kind of quiet. I like to watch Science Channel and uh, Biography Channel, and I like to lay on my couch and take naps. That's my idea of a good time. But um, uh, there is a lot behind what we do. At General Motors, I was a uh, designer responsible for uh, a transmission, okay? Specifically, I was responsible for the small transmissions that, that I went into Cavaliers, Grand Ams, those size General Motors cars. And that was my responsibility. Lisa's responsibility was clutches and, sh and um, shift systems. It can be frustrating at times because you can get just one dimension inside a transmission run and you have junk. That's all it takes is one dimension. So, very technical. Um, but uh, that's what we do here. We, all we do is transmissions and drivetrain products, clutches, clutch systems. Um, we know which dimensions to pay attention to and monitor in production to ensure a good product. We live it first hand. Um, you know, Lisa was born and raised here, so she's really seen it. You know, her father was an executive for General Motors. Her brother still works there, and she worked there. Um, so her family in particular has seen the, you know, the demise. Um, for example, uh, right here in Lansing, in the uh, 
mid 80s. First of all, Lansing is an Oldsmobile town. Um, the nameplate of Oldsmobile was born here in 1903, familiar year. And um, of course, they, they, they bailed on the name, I think, in 2000 or 2002. You know, and it was pronounced dead and buried. But um, in the mid 80s, at plant one here in Lansing, they were making 500,000 cars a year out of that one plant. And that one plant made more cars than any plant in the whole world at the time. Um, and you can do the math on what kind of uh, employment and personnel is required to build 500,000 cars. It's a lot of people. Well, um, that plant's now closed. Um, uh, there's some smaller plants that have been rebuilt in the area, so it's not completely dead here. But I would say the auto industry in the Lansing area probably employs 10% of what it used to. Beyond just closing it down and cannibalizing the factory, they a lot of times just demolish it and leave it a huge pile of rubble. So you go somewhere, and this actually happened with our kids. We were at a, a track meet at a school across from where a Fisher Body factory used to be. Fisher Body, yeah. Um, actually, where my grandfather's worked. And the kids said, what is that mess over there? I'm like, that's the factory where your great-grandfather's worked. Mm -hmm. And it's just, um, I mean, I guess they cleaned up eventually, but you can't turn a pile of rubble into a factory to make weapons or anything else that you need. It's just gone. And there was just a documentary on TV I guess last week I raised a lot of a lot of attention about Detroit. They showed a bunch of aerial pictures and the destruction of Detroit. Now war zone. Gonna, yeah, it's like a war zone. And so how are you ever going to revive it? And uh, you know, people were really upset about showing Detroit in an unfavorable light like that. But um, but that's real. That's real. We try to keep we try to supply as many parts as we can right here in Michigan. And not everything comes from Michigan, but it, it comes from you know, areas around here, because the state is so hungry after the, the problems with the auto industry. There's so many machine shops and little suppliers that make, make parts that are just, just so hungry for business. And you know, when we first started, do we make these components ourselves that you design, okay. or, or do we source, source them out? Well, we source, source them out because there's, there's shops with machines waiting, people waiting I to make the parts. When I hired in in 84 to Oldsmobile, if you had, if you drove a foreign car, you had to park at the far back end of the lot. And even then, you ran the risk of uh, getting keyed or windows smashed because there were some pretty, pretty um, strong feelings about that. My opinion that um, it's, now, 2010, people have really forgotten what it's like to, to, to be American and buy American. Um, but I think they're starting to get it now, after this recession kicked in. And the reason they're starting to get it is their son or their, um, their husband can no longer get that $15 and $20 an hour job. Um, he's getting an $8 or $10 an hour job. And with that, we're, we're starting to breed a, a whole new breed of people that uh, they won't have the, uh, the financial ability to go out and buy a boat to enjoy with their family. They won't have the, the ability to do a lot of things that we've done in the past. And, and what I hope happens is that they realize this and really start rejecting um, foreign things. When I go to a store, if there's an American alternative, no matter what the price, I'm going to buy it. And the reason I'm going to buy it is this, is that I know that somebody's American family is being supported with that extra money that I'm paying for a quality American hammer. I know that if I buy the Chinese hammer, I'm paying to grow their economy, 
that doesn't give a rat's ass about us. And, um, and I hope that people in the future realize this, um, the, the, the ripple effect of when they're buying even a small item like a hammer, what it does to the fabric of America.